Hello viewers, this is Chandrakala Chaudhary. Neighborhood first policy has always been a crucial part of India's foreign policy and Prime Minister Narendra Modi has time and again mentioned about neighborhood first, be it with Sri Lanka, Bangladesh or Nepal. But this policy has always been a clear exception for Pakistan and for very good reasons. No country in this world has hurt India as much as Pakistan has. The relations between the two nations has even gone more frosty after India revoked Article 370 in Jammu and Kashmir. So today we are going to discuss about where does this relation stands. We have with us Major General G. D. Bakshi. Hello, sir. Thank you for joining us at this very crucial juncture where the world is witnessing a very, very geopolitical challenges. My first question to you is, as we must know, that Pakistan has invited India for the SCO summit in October, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. What does it signify and do you think will India accept Pakistan's olive branch, as we may call it? You know, Pakistan has some nerve trying to give us this olive branch or some chutzpah, as that uh, English word I think is very apt that uh, Pakistan has been doing everything in its power to try and hurt India, to try and cause us serious problems. It started a few years back with Pakistan trying to revive the terrorist movement south of the Pir Punjab. Don't forget, we had moved out uniform force from there to Ladakh to face the Chinese challenge. Then during COVID, we had for three years stopped all recruitment so that there would be no infection spreading into the armed forces. Every year, 60,000 people retire and there were no recruitments. So we have effectively slashed the army by 1,80,000, right? And uh, there were quite obviously gaps created. And Pakistan has been doing its level best to exploit those gaps, to revive terrorism in Kashmir, that is south of the Peer Punjab, and in Punjab. It's K2 famous or infamous K2 project, right? Then Pakistan has crossed all limits by, you know, taking part or trying to be the cat's paw for the uh, CIA in trying to, uh, you know, orchestrate a colored revolution in Bangladesh. I mean, it is like some Arab Spring being executed there. And uh, the cat's paw is Pakistan's ISI, which has close links with jamaat e islami and right. Pakistan recently was on cloud nine when uh, poor Hasina Wajid Begum was forced to flee to India to seek asylum in India, to seek refuge in India. As the mobs, you know, went about ransacking her house, destroying, creating chaos and mayhem in the streets of uh, Dhaka. The simple fact is that Pakistan has been crowing that it has undone the strategic restructuring of the subcontinent of South Asia that was affected by India in 1971 by breaking Pakistan in two, by creating a new nation state with the force of arms right. and, right. you know, uh, uh, forming Bangladesh, a new republic on the face of this earth. India had midwife the birth of uh, Bangladesh, right? So, uh, the same cast of characters that was trying to oppose the birth of Bangladesh has again come together to try and turn the clock back, right? Uh, that is Pakistan, the United States of America, and hovering malevolently on the margins is China, right? The same cast right. of characters had done their level best to try and uh, stop the emergence of Bangladesh, you know? And uh, Richard Nixon, as you recall, had leaned in favor of Pakistan, leaned heavily in favor of Pakistan. He had sent the Seventh Fleet. Henry Kissinger had gone on record to block the uh, shipment of, uh, uh, you know, radars, which India had already paid for, air defense radars. And thoughtfully, he passed on those radar gaps to the Chinese to encourage them to attack India and take the pressure of Pakistan. They went to that extent. Fortunately, the Soviet Union had intervened at that time and sent its nuclear submarines into the Bay of Bengal to, you know, checkmate uh, the Seventh Fleet. And that's how India had been, uh, you know, gotten out of a very messy, tricky kind of a situation. Now they have tried to turn the clock back. 
you know uh, so sir it's a I, it's a big question that you know can we uh, can we ever expect a thaw in this ties because as the relations has been impacting the broader south asian region in terms of stability and development in the current geopolitical scenario can we ever in this in this era can we expect a thaw between india and pakistan and if so what would be the way forward look uh, i would like to be hopeful and optimistic but i'm i am afraid if you view it realistically the grounds for extreme pessimism the military isi complex in pakistan will never accept for peace with india you know uh, that they will front the politicians the puppet masters will put forth the pygmy politicians who come for nothing in pakistan to try and start dialogues with india while they go ahead with business as usual in trying to stoke terrorism in trying to create chaos and mayhem in india's neighborhood in trying to destabilize india in trying to wage ghazwai hind through asymmetric warfare i see absolutely no scope no scope whatsoever for any kind of a reconciliation grand bargain the simple fact is that pakistan today is on the brink of economic meltdown the people of pakistan cannot get two square meals a day they are now being burdened with electricity bills of 60000 rupees a month of people whose monthly pay is 40000 rupees a month i mean how is this state viable there is almost virtual civil war that has broken out in pakistan whether you see baluchistan just 25th of august you know they 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 had uh, you know the, the, the baluchi insurgents had launched that hero of operation hero of which means dark black wind you know storm black storm kind of a thing in which the uh, baluch liberation organized the army bla's insurgents the majid brigade had attacked the bela camp of the pakistan army they had killed about 40 people you know there were two suicide bombers one was a female suicide bomber uh, you know asma B- B- baluch and uh, there was the uh, right. the other her uh, comrade they blasted uh, they brought in an uh, ied laden vehicle blasted it at the gate the majid brigade had entered killed about 40 pakistani soldiers right of the pakistan army concurrently they had laid ambushes on a number of highways leading to the bela camp along which pakistani reinforcements would come and they had ambushed quite a number of them and about 60 more pakistanis had been killed they had tried to sort of you know uh, control the the traffic on the highways and they had brought down uh, pa- uh, the punjabi pakistanis from the buses and shot them in cold blood you see and this was to the 18th anniversary of the assassination of shaheed uh nawab uh, bukti you know uh, bukti had been murdered by parvez musharraf about 18 years ago on that particular day 20 uh, 26th of uh, august to be more specific so they had uh, coincided this attack for that there is trouble in sindh there is trouble in uh, pakhtun khwa and the most serious fault line that is emerging is the pathan pashtun fault line Imran Khan has given a run for its money to the Pakistan army he has defamed brought down the reputation of the Pakistan army in the mud don't forget what had happened last year you see hunger leads to anger and angry hungry mobs rampaging mobs on lahore streets of lahore they had attacked the core commander's house ransacked his uh, palatial bungalow you know taken away his white peacocks and had them for lunch you know uh, emptied his uh, fridge of all the goodies the craft cheap, exotic fruit etc you know it is it is unthinkable of such a thing happening in pakistan because the one institution that was respected provided stability was the pakistan army now the pakistan army as right. i shall recount is itself in doldrums serious problems yes So, so coming I to the Bangladesh situation, right, right, right. Let's let's just talk about the situation in Bangladesh. So, do you <laughs> see a possible tilting of Pakistan to Bangladesh again? Uh, do we go back to the? Are we going back to the era of 1971 somehow? What would be your take as far as because we have seen that the Pakistan 
is amping up efforts to outreach the new interim government there in Bangladesh. Probably, how do you see the outcome, or you know, what can be expected? Uh, you see, what has happened in Bangladesh is almost like a geopolitical earthquake. The magnitude of a seven magnitude earthquake in South Asia. The simple fact is that we had re-engineered the entire uh, geopolitical landscape in South Asia by creating Bangladesh in 1971. It was a massive, massive victory for India and which had made, uh, you know, India emerge as the preeminent power in South Asia, right? Now they're trying, the Americans and the Pakistanis have joined hands to try and, and undo they had preeminence and, you know, create very grave security problems, challenges for India in the neighborhood. Uh, if you recall, last year, uh, General Asim Muni, Pakistan's chief of army staff, had visited the United States of America. And there, apart from meeting the generals and the officials in the Pentagon, the Secretary of Defense, etc., who do you think he had met? Victoria Nuland. Now, who is Victoria okay. Nuland? She was the architect of the Maidan coup in Ukraine. She has okay. been the brain behind many of the colored revolutions all over the world, which the CIA, CIA is now specializing in. Why did he have to meet Victoria Nuland? There was something very suspicious. You know, I, uh, everybody ears had pricked up when we heard of this meeting. And Victoria Nuland then came to Bangladesh, uh, and we all know Asina Wajid is on record as saying and has written, put it down in writing, that an American official had come and met her and told her that she would have no problems in the elections if she played ball. And how was she supposed to play ball? She was supposed to hand over the St. Martin's Island to the United States so that it would become a base for the American Navy and the American Air Force in the Bay of Bengal, right, to exert pressure on all the... Uh, neighboring countries, including India, Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar, etc. Number two, they had asked her for help in a project to create a Christian state, a cookie state on the Indo-Myanmar border. And right. we are seeing that trailer now right. play out in, uh, in, in uh, Manipur, where the cookies Manipur. are using drones to attack the security forces, to attack the villages, etc. Drones are being used, you see. It is a replay of the Ukraine scenario all over again, you know, uh, and the cat's paw that uh, uh, the CIA chose for this particular operation was Pakistan's ISI because it has close links with the jamaat -e islami in Bangladesh. And through the jamaat -e islami they had penetrated every single student union, whether in the University of Dhaka, Rangshai, Chittagong, etc., all over the major towns and cities of Bangladesh, they had penetrated the, the uh, student unions. And then through these student unions, an orchestrated campaign was started to get down. Whatever you say, she had come through a legitimate election, right? Uh, you can say that the opposition did not participate. You can't force the opposition to participate, you see. And you can't stop elections because they are refusing to participate. So, uh, 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 you know, they, they tried to exploit the angst about the reservation issue. 30% reservation for sons and grandchildren right. of yeah. Mukti Jodas, right? Now, the Supreme Court had cut it down to 5%. So, the basic causes belly was now over, done with. I mean, that uh, the problem had been resolved, but that was not the problem. The problem was topple the Hasina Wajid government, come hell or high water. So, then they escalated to you have used excessive force against the student union and suddenly this thing snowballed. You know, the students uh, then, you know, uh, were bearing down on our uh, prime ministerial house and the army chief of Bangladesh, who incidentally happens to be a distant relation of Asina Wajed and uh, had served in the prime minister's office earlier. He told her, Madam, you have 45 minutes, get away because we can't save you. It's as simple as that, you know, and she was forced to flee, right? There are, so are we going yeah. back to that era? Of course, are we going back are. to this era of liberation war? Or 1971, that is, that's precisely what I'm saying. The entire restructuring of subcontinental security achieved by India in 71 has now been undone. Right. You are again in a three-front situation. Three and a half to be more specific. 
you know previously we were in a two and a half front situation china pakistan huh. and the uh, terrorists and maoists right now we are in a three and a half front situation there's china there's pakistan there is a pretty hostile bangladesh where Muhammad Yunus, the darling of the democratic dispensation in the United States, has been parachuted in. Has he been elected? Who's elected him? No. How is this more legitimate than the government of Hasina Bajet? Please, I, I, I fail to understand that. You know, and this is a very familiar tactic of uh, the United States of America. You know, uh, look at the American elections themselves. There has been an assassination attempt on Donald Trump right. himself, Donald Trump, yes. the yes. Republican nominee, right? Uh, he himself has been talking of how the elections were rigged. So I think America might as well look within before it starts pontificating on how other democracies are to conduct elections. Because I don't see uh, Muhammad Yunus, the legitimacy of Muhammad Yunus. He may be, the Americans may be very fond of him. Does that mean he has to be the officiating prime minister of, uh, of, of, of Bangladesh, right? And what is the implication of this? Is the jihad -e islami in Bangladesh saying that they want to be recolonized by West Pakistan? You know, Pakistan had colonized so and rooted Bangladesh, you know. Uh, I, look, I took part in the 71 war. With my own eyes, I've seen how right. one million Bangladeshis were killed 3 million Bangladeshi women were raped and 10 million Bangladeshis, almost 80% of them Hindus, had been driven out into India. Now, uh, Muhammad Yunus may have taken charge. I'm sorry, he is not in control. Right? The mobs are still rampaging. It's very, yeah. you know, it's great, uh, it's great fun to go and loot the Prime Minister's house. So, uh, so, you know, uh, you have been mentioning about uh, uh, the, the governments, of course, in both the sides yeah, that I have yeah, asked you. Yeah. Like, you know, how do you see the Shehbaz Sharif government? You know, it is, he is capable of an, enough as a new PM and, you know, he is capable of signaling a breakthrough between both the nations. How do you see that? Look, uh, the simple fact is, theoretically, it sounds very credible that he is the younger brother of uh, Nawaz Sharif and Nawaz Sharif had yes. made a famous outreach to India before or uh, 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 Vajpayee, Prime Minister Vajpayee had made an outreach to uh, Nawaz Sharif before Kargil and uh, we all yes. know how that yeah. ended up, right? We all know how that uh, peace overture ended up by a stab in the back by General Parvez Musharraf who subsequently overthrew Nawaz Sharif for his pain. So the simple point is, what does Shahbaz Sharif count for? Nothing. Is he in charge? No. Who is the person in charge in Pakistan? General uh, Asim Munir. And he fancies himself another Parvez Musharraf. He is doing his damnedest to hurt mm -hmm. India. And if he thinks that right. India will come to the, ne uh, the negotiating table for peace talks with him, because of uh, the pressure that he is mounting south of the Pir Punjal in Punjab and because of the regime change in Bangladesh. That's an outright hostile act of war, more or less, against India. So, we are not going to respond in a uh, favorable manner to any overture from Pakistan. Like the foreign minister said, the era of uninterruptible dialogue mm -hmm. is dead and over. You see, Pakistan army yes, yes. itself is in doldrums for the first time. Please understand that the reputation of the Pakistan army is in mud. In fact, Pakistani journalists are saying that uh, mm. it is even worse than it was after the defeat in the 71 war. When they were down rock bottom, they had hit with the public of Pakistan, right? For all their right, uh, goof-ups and the way they had their country broken up, they couldn't mm -hmm. defend the nation, etc. Uh, their reputation was badly, right. badly tarnished. It is said to be even worse now because of Imran Khan. But what is happening in the Pakistan army is that there is a, there is a virtual uh, inner war taking place within the Pakistan army. The DGISI. You know, Hamid, General Hamid, who was the former DGISI, who uh, Imran Khan wanted to make the next army chief. Well, he's been put behind bars and they are going to right, hold sir. a summary general court martial against him in terms of this thing. Uh, there is a virtual war between the Directorate General of Military Intelligence, DGMI, 
and the DGISI, Inter Services Intelligence of the Pakistan Army. Mm. There is a war. Uh, right. Asim Munir is trying to post out officers en masse, trying to get his loyalist place there. The mutual suspicion has never, the entire organizational trust has broken down. Asim Munir is about to retire. Uh, he is hoping for an extension because no army chief in Pakistan ever wants to retire. He has to be taken kicking and screaming out of office, right? So, the simple right. fact is that uh, so far he has not been given an extension. He has not been given an extension. There are, and now the latest shocker is that uh, uh, General Bajwa, former army chief, has been called back from, uh, uh, you know, called back from uh, from Belgium and has been placed under house arrest. The entire ecosystem which had helped to bring Imran Khan back to power is now they are trying to sort power. it out. You know, and on 8th of September, Imran Khan has threatened to relaunch his agitation. So the Pakistani army seems to be damn nervous. And this is the time at which they have been hit by the revolt in uh, Baluchistan, revolt in Sindh, revolt in Pakhtunkhwa, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, revolt in uh, Gilgit Baltistan, uprising in POK. I mean, there is serious problem. Economic collapse, meltdown and civil war. And the Pakistan army itself weakening and crumbling from within. So these are very interesting times to live through and we'll have to wait and watch. Yeah. So now let's talk about the JNK polls because it's going to polls very soon. Jammu and Kashmir, right. there will be polls. So do, do you think Pakistan might disrupt the polls uh, in an attempt to send strong message or signals to the international community that the elections do not represent the true wishes of the people of JNK? Because we know the issue of JNK that has been one of the major core point of India-Pakistan. Right, right. You know. You see, the simple fact of the matter is that Pakistan will try everything in its power to try and disrupt the election. It will be up to us to see that he is not allowed to interfere. The very fact of trying to revive the terrorism south of the Pir Panjal, taking advantage of the, uh, you know, rolling up of the CI grid there, intelligence grid there, north of the Pir Panjals in Kashmir, we had super saturated the area with troops and the results are there for all to see. But uh, south of the Pir Panjal, we have weakened that whole grid has gone. The entire CI grid is gone and therefore mm -hmm. Pakistan has tried to take the fullest advantage of it over the last 3-4 years. And this year, when Modi 3.0 government was being sworn in, uh, the ISI tried to give them a welcome gift in terms of slaughtering about 52. Uh, they wanted to kill all 52 citizens in that bus in Riyasi. It's just lucky that uh, they played dead and they survived. But the Pakistani attempt was to shoot up the whole damn bus. So that is what they have started with. That is not a very good augury for uh, how things will shape out. India is, of course, mustering up its forces, its resources to try and see that we have a uh, incident-free election. But uh, let's be let's be uh, quite quite uh, certain that Pakistan will do everything in its uh, power to try and disrupt that election. It will be up to us to try and stymie his nefarious plots. Right, sir. My last question to you, it's a very, very crucial question because in the past we have seen there has been several attempts of by different countries to mediate when it comes to India-Pakistan relations. So what role does the international community play in mediating or influencing India-Pakistan ties? Because we have seen countries coming and commenting on the internal uh, on 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 this particular relations on india pakistan for that matter what would be your take you know the simple fact of the matter is it has been a tenet of indian foreign policy not to accept foreign mediation or meddling in the matter of jammu and kashmir ah. we are quite clear that it is our right. territory legally it belongs to us and the Maharaja of Kashmir had mm. signed the instrument of accession that was irrevocable. There were no ifs and buts. It was Lord Louis Mountbatten, then Governor General, and Nehru who tried to uh, impose ifs and buts. There are no ifs and buts. And now that we removed Article 370, 35A, India is very clear. It is a it is a sovereign Indian territory, and we will not accept foreign meddling. Any talks between India and Pakistan will have to be bilateral. 
we will not accept foreign meddling absolutely clear so i don't see any country wanting to poke its nose in even the united nations has widely held back uh, from uh, interfering in these things because this is a faith a comply as simple as that and if pakistan wants to change this faith a comply i'm afraid it will have to go to war and i'm not too sure with the condition of the pakistani economy it is in any shape to go to war because one war with india now there will be one certain yeah. outcome pakistan will right. collapse economically forever and no amount of bailouts on the imf or saudi arabia or uae or for that matter china will be able to save it so this uh, the rivalry between india and pakistan do you think this would hamper the russia china led sco for that matter or do you think that india's uh, you know india should be attending sco for that matter because we have seen that it has clarified it it has not been officially informed that what would be india's stand will prime minister modi will be sending some other minister to attend it or he himself will be attending so how do you see this quickly if you can just tell our viewers you know i i would reckon that at best we might send a ministerial level representative or even uh, uh, you know official level representative i do not see prime minister modi at all going to islamabad for this particular summit given all that pakistan ah. has been up to in the inter in the last few months all right sir thank you so much for joining and uh, sharing your views on this very very important topic india pakistan thank you for thank inviting you. me thank you for inviting thank you sir looking ahead Jai. to join again thank you yeah hit